right. Well, I wanted to introduce myself. Hello, my name is Kim Broker. I'm one of the registrars here at the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, as you can see, I'm actually in the gallery today. I'm in the Gertrude Bernoulli Gallery upstairs. Um, where we have some of our permanent collection on display. I decided to come in today because it just felt right to be here um, just for a moment to, to talk with you all. Um, so welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, wherever you're joining from us. We're really so very grateful that you're here and I um, hope that we will have a engaging and interesting conversation here um, with you this today. Um, I am delighted to welcome Christy Jeffcoat and Megan Emery from the Midwest Art Conservation Center in Minneapolis. Um, will you guys wave um, so everybody can know who, you're, who you are? Um, they have been wonderful partners over the years. We've worked with MAC or the Midwest Art Conservation Center since 2011. Um, and so it just really seemed very fitting to have them come today to talk to us about some of the projects that we have worked on together over the past few years. Um, Megan Emery is Chief Conservator and Senior Object Conservator at MAC. Um, she joined in 2013, coming from the Cincinnati Art Museum. She holds a Master's of Arts with a Certificate of Advanced Study in Conservation from the State University College of New York at Buffalo, or SUNY Buffalo. She is a Fellow of the American Institute for Conservation, Historic and Artistic Works, and a member of the International Institute for Conservation. Megan brings extensive experience with ethnographic and archeological materials, ceramics, lacquer, plasters, and the conservation of large scale contemporary sculpture. Christy Jeffcoat joined Mac in 2014 as their senior paintings conservator. She holds a Master's of Art in Conservation from Queen's University in Ontario and a post baccalaureate certificate in art conservation from Studio Art Centers International in Florence. She came to Max from the West Lake Conservators Center in Schenectady, New York, the Western Center for Conservation of Fine Arts in Denver, and the Denver Art Museum, where she was a Crest Fellow. Uh, we are so very glad you're here. So thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Quickly, I want to give everyone an overview of what we'll be talking about today, just to give you a sense of the flow of things. Um, we'll start by just giving a quick overview of MAC and our partnership with them. We will give you an overview of some considerations that we all take, both from the museum's point of view and as a conservator, when planning and carrying out conservation treatments. To do so, we'll look at four recent and pretty interesting conservation treatments of both two paintings and two sculptures or objects. The first two works we'll look at are by William Merritt Chase and Ludwig Meinder. And then we'll look at Henry Moore's reclining figure and a selection of our Greek faces. Um, the hope is that these examples will give us the opportunity to compare and contrast methodologies, treatments, and just share some of the fun things that we've been working on. We've received some questions in advance and have kind of integrated those into the presentation, but we do hope that you will feel free to jump in and ask questions at any point in time throughout the conversation. We will be checking the Q&A box, which I think you can find up here at the bottom, and that's where you should put your questions. Um, and after each kind of moment of the conversation, we will stop and address questions, but if it seems right to stop and talk about a particular topic to try to do so. Um, as a friendly reminder, we're not able to see you. So <laughs> you can feel free to relax. Um, we know many of you are at home enjoying your Saturday. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, so feel free to get comfortable and we'll begin. Um, Megan, let's start by talking with you here about MAC. Um, why would the Kemper Art Museum decide to partner with MAC on Really. <laughs> well, the Midwest Art Conservation Center is a nonprofit institution, and we call, um, in the past we've been known as a regional lab. And what that means is that instead of individual museums having their own conservation lab on site, 
we are available to work for many large, middle-sized and small museums and collecting institutions um, to help them um, conserve and preserve their art collections without them having to have the resources of a full-time staff conservator and the full lab setup. And so the Midwest Art Conservation Center is um, based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We have been located there for over 40 years. In fact, this is our 43rd year in operation. And in the late 1970s, a group of regional labs were started across the country. Most of them are located on the East Coast or on the West Coast, but in the Midwest, there is one in Ohio and there is one in Minneapolis. And so we've been very grateful to partner with museums and institutions all throughout the center of the United States. Um, we work um, quite a bit in Missouri, we work in Kentucky, and also a lot of the surrounding states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, South Dakota, North Dakota. We travel um, to the institutions. However, most of the time, artwork will actually come to our conservation labs for work and treatment. Mm -hmm. um, however, we can, and you'll hear throughout as we go when their opportunities have been for us to be on site versus work coming mm -hmm. to the lab. And we can be a resource. We also have preventive conservation on staff. And so that is something where we can help um, look, take, look at a big picture of conservation, look at how to take care of the collection as a whole. We can help registrars um, and museum um, staff and curators really understand what's going on with their collection as a whole, but also we treat individual objects. What you're seeing right now is a few snapshots of work taking place um, by Mac conservators. Um, and in most cases, you're seeing lab work. However, there's an outdoor sculpture view as well there. Um, and it's shot in the gallery. We have eight treatment conservators on staff. We have three paintings conservators, two objects conservators, two works on paper conservators, one textile conservator. We also have two conservators on staff in our preventive conservation department. And they are the ones who kind of go and out and do surveys of, um, of the collection as a whole um, and and also provide uh, workshops on disaster preparedness and how to care for collections and they really look at best management and they help museums and institutions with the big picture but the treatment conservators are spending most of their time in the labs really um, working on individual objects wonderful and that's actually kind of how we got to know you guys i mean in 2011 we received a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services to do a survey of our sculpture collection, all 430 some objects in the sculpture collection. So you guys actually came down to the museum and spent two weeks with us um, looking at literally every object that we owned and, and assessing its condition. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a major job. Um, I and mean, the museum itself doesn't have a permanent conservator on our staff and we have always been very fortunate to partner on various projects with the St. Louis Arts Museum's conservator team. Um, but it, for a survey like, like this, where it just took so long and so focused really, we really needed to bring in outside help. Um, as, a, as a registrar, I am trained to do condition reports, but I don't have the training as a conservator. Um, so I really have always appreciated the ability to just call you up and just be like, okay, I have this problem. I have this thing. What do we do with it? Um, the Institute for Museum, of, Museum and Library Services, um, or IMLS, has funded a number of surveys for the museum. Um, in 2011, we worked on a sculpture survey, and in 2014, we did a painting survey. Um, why would the museum want to, to assess every object in its collection? Megan, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so one of the reasons why um, we do, uh, we call them object by object surveys usually. And one of the reasons why uh, things like the sculpture survey or the painting survey is undertaken, um, and I see you here have a potential in the future one for the works on paper in your collection. Mm -hmm. The reason why we like to do that is that we can come in and take a look at all the objects in a Sometimes it's a specific collection. Sometimes it's an entire group, for instance, all of your 400 and some sculpture pieces. And we can look at them quickly and assess each one for their condition. And we complete condition report forms and it, or survey forms. And it usually has very basic information. Here you can see um, two of our conservators, Nicole Grable, who is now one of our preventive conservators, 
and Donna Haberman, who has actually retired and I have I, um, replaced her when she retired. Um, you can see them doing the survey um, back in 2011 and a survey form on the side. So basically it is check boxes. And now we've gone to a digital format, but it's the same thing. And we look at the objects and quickly decide, all right, this is, it's got surface condition issues. Is it structurally stable? What needs to happen? Is it in good condition? And we rank them. We prioritize them for treatment. And what this does is that we compile all that information and provide it all to the client, for instance, the Kemper, and they take it and they can say, okay, we have 10 high priority conservation treatments, meaning these really need to be treated because they're unstable, they can't go on display in their current condition, and look, we have 250 that are in great condition and don't need anything right now. So it allows the museum to then go and apply for more grants to have treatment opportunities done with the next step. So we can come in and kind of prioritize versus a registrar who has a great understanding of there's something wrong here, but we can actually give the, the real um, examination data of why certain objects are higher priority than others for treatment. Right. It's also been a valuable kind of assessment for us to be able to go to our own administration and to be like, okay, like we're doing a pretty good job. This is what we need to do to kind of continue to care and preserve the collection. Because even though we've had many of these works in our holdings for over a hundred years, in many cases, um, things constantly evolve. They're, they're getting handled, they're getting shown in other institutions um, and also materials age. So it's just like every few years, every decade or so, I mean, we need to kind of know what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And also as um, the science and the practice of art conservation changes, the approaches to treatment change too. It does. Um, and some of that we'll kind of touch upon today as we look at the, at the treatments that we'll be discussing. Um, mm -hmm. In addition to looking at all of the work paper, which is a future project, um, we do kind of continue to re receive grant funding to do more treatments. Um, but the surveys have allowed us to prioritize, um, prioritize the need. Um, other reasons we do conservation is if a work needs to be prepared for display. Its need may not necessarily be urgent in terms of like its stability, but we often want to improve the appearance of something. Um, so these surveys help prioritize both the condition need, the structural need, and the territorial need. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. We've also looked at the museum's collection of Greek vases, and that project was um, funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And some of the treatments um, have been funded so far by um, the Department of Classics and the Department of Art History and Archaeology here at Washington University. Um, but with all of these projects, they're really pretty much always ongoing. Um, so it's pretty exciting to uh, think about the future. Mm -hmm. uh, so here are two examples of survey forms for the paintings by Chase and Meitner that we'll talk about today. Um, but in many cases, these survey forms, which were created really pretty quickly. I mean, maybe a 15 minute, half hour examination. Um, this is really just a starting point, correct? Um, this is not necessarily a treatment proposal. It's just a red flag of being like, okay, here is, here is where this ranks in our needs. Mm -hmm. um, the next steps really after the museum decides to send something to MAC for treatment um, is what we kind of like to begin with now. Um, we'll look first at William Merritt Chase's Garden of the Orphanage, um, which is from 1883. Um, Christy, would you like to kind of share with us why this painting was on the list for treatment? And sure. Yeah, so, um, so this was part of the original painting survey, uh, this uh, painting by William Merritt Chase. And um, as was mentioned by both you and Megan, that one of the main outcomes of a survey is to um, uh, put on a like a conservation priority, and we do that by putting the, by attributing a number to it, um, and it's a one through four system. So the Chase, for instance, um, received a, a priority 
number two, which meant that it mainly had aesthetic issues and that structurally it was pretty stable. So you can see here um, on the survey that the priority is a two. Um, so it was, it needed treatment, but it wasn't, it was structurally sound and, it, and most of the issues were aesthetic. Um, and what that means is that it would benefit from, um, from a surface cleaning, basically removing the varnish is what it mainly needed. So what happened after the painting came to the lab? What, what do you do first? Sure. Um, so when an object comes into the lab, we perform a full examination. So the survey, as you said, is just a brief kind of snapshot of what we can see, mm -hmm. um, the issues with the painting and what it's made out of. But when it comes to the lab, we need to do a full examination, taking into account both the aesthetic issues and structural issues involved. Um, and so the full examination re um, involves a, a report on condition and a proposal for treatment, which includes like a cost estimate also. And so during the exam, we look at the materials used to make the painting, um, what kind of paint medium it is, um, what, kind, what type of varnish is on the surface, if it's even varnished. Um, we look at if it's had any restoration in the past. Um, as well as any condition issues at that moment in time. Um, we look at the painting using different types of light sources. We look at it using UV fluorescence, for instance, and that can tell us more information about the varnish. It can tell us um, if it's been retouched in the past, if it has uh, been treated in the past. We look at it using raking light, um, which means taking a light, like a flashlight, and just holding it on the side of the painting so that the light and kind of um, rake across the, the surface and that can tell us if there's any planar deformations. We also look at it under microscopy um, to look at just to find out more information about what is happening with the painting. Um, we also make tiny little solvent tests to understand the materials better, what type of varnish is on the surface and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and so what is a solvent test, Christy? So um, we use different types of solvents just to be able to um, understand what, what the different materials are, are soluble in. And that can tell us what type of varnish is on the surface, if, it's, if there's a grime layer, what type of grime layer, if it's um, like a soot kind of grime, or if it's just general dirt, if it's um, from cigarette smoking in the house, the kind of thing. So we can just better understand exactly what the different layers are on the surface that right, just using right, different right. types of light sources kind of touch on the, you know, touch on those topics a little bit, but then the solvent tests, mm -hmm. which are really tiny and usually in nondescript places that you can't see, um, mm -hmm. right? So um, after, once the proposal is complete and the condition report is complete, we send it off to the client and it, the, once the proposal is approved, then we can um, start following the steps that were proposed during the exam, we can start treatment. And, um, and we always start with uh, before treatment photographs. So um, all treatment is backed up by written documentation as well as photographic documentation. We take before and after treatment photos of, of all of our treatments and oftentimes during treatment photos as necessary. So there's a lot of documentation that's involved. Right. So it really sounds like a lot of work is really done before a treatment actually begins. Yes. Um, and you really have to get a pretty good handle on what it is you're working with before just jumping in. Um, True. Do you ever refer to any documentation that's provided by the museum or do you really just are you mostly concerned with what you are seeing in front of you? Well, no, so definitely we're always in consultation with, um, with museum staff, with, uh, with the owners, if it's a private client also, just mm -hmm. um, they often have lots of information. If it's been treated in the past, then if there's any record mm -hmm. of that treatment, that can be very beneficial in, um, in the, how we approach a treatment as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It can give us, you know, better insight into the actual materials that were used and right. um, can right. definitely help. So there's always consultation and any information, past information that we can get our hands on is very helpful. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, one of the responsibilities that I have as, as a registrar is, is maintaining the object files. Um, the museum has a file literally on every object um, in its collection. Um, and that file kind of records some of its, its exhibition history, its literature history, ownership. Um, while we keep files of this, there is evidence of ownership and exhibition history on objects in many cases. Um, in the slide that you're seeing here, which is a picture of the, the front and the back or the recto and the verso of the painting by Chase, um, you'll see a number of artwork labels stuck on the back of the artwork. Um, you'll even see our accession number written in red paint pretty big on the back of the back too. Um, while we don't necessarily write things in red paint um, anymore, I mean, we still do record the object's accession number on the item, just in a little bit more of a minimal way now. Um, so do you, what was my question, I apologize. Um, so you, you rely on this, this historical information to make a judgment of, of what its needs are. Um, this, the back of this painting seems a little bit unusual. I mean, I thought that this was a, a painting on canvas, um, but the back of it seems like it's maybe mounted to something. What are we looking at here? Right, okay, so um, the Chase painting, it had undergone a restoration uh, some time in its past. And um, what we're seeing here is that during that restoration, it was removed from its stretcher. So originally it would have been a typical easel painting where it was stretched on a stretcher um, and it was taken off of that stretcher and uh, lined completely to a masonite panel. So what you see on the right uh, is that masonite panel. And then they took the, the stretcher, possibly the original stretcher, we don't know, um, and adhered that to the reverse as well. So that's the stretcher attached to the back of the masonite panel and then the front is the, is the painting. Um, so it was, it was fully lined onto a masonite panel at some point, and then painted gray on the reverse, just for aesthetic reasons, most likely. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, one thing I wanted to point out to everybody is that this composition is really pretty large. Um, the dimensions are 66 or almost 67 inches by 79 inches. Um, so why would a painting this big need to be lined, especially to such a rigid support? Right, that's a very interesting question. So, um, you know, linings have, so I, I guess I should give a description of what a lining is first. So, and they're very, there are a lot of reasons why paintings are lined. So it's, um, oftentimes it's done prophylactically just as, you know, just to ensure that nothing is going to happen to the painting in the future if there's a, an environmental change or something. So people were just trying to do it just to be safe, um, that often happened in the past. Um, but typically linings happen if for some reason the canvas or the, um, the fabric, whatever it is painted on, can no longer structurally support the paint layers and, um, and it can no longer be stretched or, or hold its mm -hmm. integrity. So oftentimes that will happen if there are a lot of compound tears or if there are um, reoccurring flaking paint or something like that, um, then lining may, a full lining may be necessary. And what that means is adhering a secondary support. Uh, typically it's fabric, but in the case of the chase, it was masonite and um, adhering it completely to that secondary support. So then you have the, the canvas and then you have a secondary support on the back. Um, and it could be, that adhesive could be a number of different things. Um, we run into quite a few different materials. So in the case of the chase, I'm not really sure exactly why it was lined to begin with. Um, the linings just are done as readily today as they were in the past. They, um, they still are needed and they're still done, mm -hmm. but um, not as often. So sometimes when you run into a painting such as this and it's not readily visible of why it was done. It could have been done prophylactically as well. Just somebody thought that it would be, um, it would, 
increase its longevity. Mm -hmm. uh, but the lining wasn't really the issue of why we, we sent pain to, to Mac in this instance. I mean, while it's kind of a, a, an approach that you wouldn't necessarily do today, say, um, the, the reasons we sent this maybe were a little bit more sympathetic. Right, exactly. And was discolored. Um, mm -hmm. and, but the study would be interesting to kind of show you an example of the change that can happen uh, with the barn sugar here, here Christy. Mm -hmm. So you were um, breaking up a little bit, but I think I understand oh, I your question. Um, so right, what we're seeing here is a, is a picture totally unrelated, but um, this is just a really good example of what a natural resin varnish does over time. It yellows and darkens, um, and so the readability of the painting is very obscured. And so um, this is a, a partial cleaning photo. You can see the white area um, that is where the varnish has been removed. And uh, yeah, it's very dramatic. So in the case of the chase, uh, the, the main issue was aesthetic um, for this. That's why it was given a priority too. And uh, this, the, the lining was very secure. It was attached. There was no delamination visible. Um, and so it was really just the aesthetic readability of the painting. Uh, this painting is very... Um, it's all about the lights and darks and the play between the two of them. And the varnish that was on it was a synthetic varnish. It wasn't a natural resin varnish like we just saw on that other painting. It was um, very dull and dry looking, which gave the, the painting a flat look. You just couldn't see the depth, the play between the light and the dark was just absent. So, it, um, so that's why it came to the lab, it needed um, that needed to be fixed. The, the saturation of the colors was very poor. Um, sometimes I like to use the analogy of a pebble on the beach or why what a proper varnish does for a painting. Um, when you have that pebble and it is wet, you know, from the water, it you can see the different colors and nuances and it just pops, right? Um, and then when it's dry, it's just kind of chalky looking and, and um, flat basically, and you can't okay. see those nuances. So that's basically what a varnish does to a painting also, and especially mm -hmm. a painting like The Chase that really um, needs that saturation of the darks and the colors just mm -hmm. to really pop. So. <laughs> Wonderful. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful image, actually. Um, varnish was actually another reason why we added the Ludwig Meidner self-portrait to our list of topics to talk about today. Um, this painting um, is really pretty fascinating in its own right, but what we, we sent it to Mac in 2016, and I believe you worked on this one as well, um, to address the inappropriate varnish that was applied to it. Um, it in this example, this illustration here, I mean, you can see, although the picture is not very good, that it's really shiny. It just kind of looks wrong. Um, our curatorial team um, had long really felt that this was inappropriate for the painting and the, the, the time period. Um, so we, we sent it up to Mac to have it be cleaned and to have the, the sheen adjusted. Um, but while it was there, we um, decided to undertake a pretty, pretty dramatic project with you. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this was a very interesting uh, project and really fun, actually. Um, so this this was a much more involved project than the chase, but they were very similar in a lot of ways. Actually, they both um, had number two priorities from the survey because it was mostly aesthetic issues. Um, at first, that's what it was thought of. Um, this one was shiny, whereas the chase was very dull. But uh, they both have been lined so using different methods. Um, but uh, this one has. Uh, known documentation of its of its uh, history of restoration, and it has a painting on the reverse. And here we see that 
that painting, um, it had been documented that it was there um, before the lining and then they performed uh, the, the complete lining on top of it. Um, so it came to the lab just for, just to correct the varnish. Uh, the varnish, as you said, was very shiny. It has been wax lined. Um, so we know the adhesive that was used on this one as we didn't know for the chase, but we know this one. And what happens when it, with a wax resin lining, um, the wax will kind of migrate to the surface and you'll actually see it on the surface. And that wax over time will start attracting dirt and dust and it will start blooming sometimes, which means giving a whitish appearance in some areas. And that's what was happening with the minor. And it starts uh, getting this gray appearance also. So the surface was uneven and glossy and had some different issues going on with it. Um, so that's what it came to the lab to, to be addressed for. But um, when it arrived, we were lucky enough or we, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but we had another painting from Mia at the same time being with the wax resin lining being reversed because there was a painting underneath. So we had this kind of precedent and this visual um, that allowed us to kind of uh, start discussing that, well, you know, maybe we could do that with, with this painting also. Maybe we could reverse the wax lining and unveil that painting again on the reverse. And so we started discussion at that point, just started investigating that possibility a little bit more. So, um, so yeah, so here we see um, that we, um, so we, in, in that process of starting to investigate if that was even possible, we needed to get an understanding of why the painting was lined in the first place. And as I mentioned earlier, that there are several reasons why <clears throat> paintings are lined. Um, a lot of times it, it could be because of a lot of cracks or paint loss. And um, we just wanted to make sure that if we do reverse the lining that we're not, that we would be able to do it in such a way that we would be able to permanently show both sides successfully to the public. Um, that there were, that it was structurally, this canvas was structurally sound enough to be able to withstand that, that it wasn't lined because of some reason that would prevent us from doing that. So here, um, one of the ways that we investigated further that was successful was using transmitted light. And that involves putting a bright light on the reverse of the painting and letting that light shine through. Um, and that uh, will reveal any kind of thinly painted areas or areas of loss, maybe some tears. And um, we can see here that there was no evidence of large tears that would compromise the canvas. Um, we can see paint loss. There, there's, you know, some significant paint loss, but it's not extreme. Um, and uh, so we felt confident that the canvas was um, held its integrity enough that it would be successful. Okay. So the idea to remove the lining wasn't necessarily we something we planned to do. But through your advice, I mean, we really determined that it might actually be possible. And since we understood that from the documentation on file that the painting that we would want to reveal was worth, worth the effort and also worth the risk, mm -hmm. um, we, we decided to, to go for it. Um, and I'm so very glad we did. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, we're actually in the gallery right now where the other side of the, the interior scene composition um, is on display. Um, and I'll show you a, an installation photograph in a few minutes um, showing the other side with the self-portrait. Um, but the process of removing it was pretty dramatic, I have to say. Um, can you just explain what we're looking at here? Um, sure. Right, so this painting, even before the lining, because it's painted on both sides, um, was, was pretty stiff. But then they added during the lining, not just one canvas, but two. So, and then with the wax resin, it was very, it was a very stiff painting and uh, didn't have the feel of a typical uh, canvas painting. So what we're seeing here is the removal process. It's, it was pretty slow, but um, I removed one of the layers first and then the second layer 
and they both had to be removed separately. Um, mm -hmm. And then you can see the, the underside painting, the interior scene underneath all of it as it's revealed. It's, it was fun. So the process was very slow and methodical, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately successful. Um, here's, so here's a side-by-side -side comparison um, of the after treatment of the, the recto and the verso of the, of the painting um, with a new structure. Um, one of the things that we had to deal with when we decided to reveal the other side of the, the painting was that we had to come up with a new way of presenting it. Um, the old stretcher no longer would work. Um, so the, the stretcher that you designed is really quite lovely <laughs> in its own way. Um, so I can't take credit for the stretcher that was um, designed by Simon Liu, but um, right, and then it was advantageous to have another painting in the lab at the same time. That was, you know, so we could see um, kind of what the process was gonna look like. Um, but yes, the stretcher is, it is pretty amazing. It, it allows for um, for both sides to be viewed. It can be custom built um, with each side being a, a different size um, so that as much of the painting as possible can be viewed. Um, you can see on the picture on the left of the self-portrait side, in order to, to attach it to the stretcher, I had to what we call strip line it which is attaching strips of linen fabric to all four edges, as opposed to fully lining. Um, and that just gives us a means to, uh, to stretch it and to bring it to proper tension and to attach it to, to a stretcher. So that's what you see in that fabric there. So here is a photograph of the gallery now and a photograph of the other side um, showing the self-portrait. Um, you also were really helpful um, in connecting us with a special framer um, who used to work at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts um, to design a special frame that allows us to present the painting, both sides of the painting in the gallery. Um, and we're really quite pleased with the, the final result and the, the presentation of it. Um, this style of frame is uh, much more appropriate to what um, would have been used um, to display the artwork originally in the mm -hmm. 19-teens um, as opposed to the very ornate frame um, that was added in the 1950s when it was sold here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I also love this installation photograph um, because it shows the relationship between the, the minor and then the Henry Moore sculpture um, right there behind me to my right. Um, it's always a treat to, to see the work, um, see the work that has been conserved on view in our galleries. And we're really sad that we're closed still to the public. Um, but it's been a treat to work on both of these projects with, with you, Christy. Um, thank you for your expertise on everything. It was fun working um, with you. It was a, a really great collaboration. Yeah, yeah. And there's always been a lot of back and forth. <laughs> um, there has, yeah. And, and we, we take these matters, especially the, the projects that have a certain level of risk um, with them very seriously. And so we have a, a great team here of, of registrars and curators um, and everybody brings to it a different perspective. Um, and I think that the end result is always pretty amazing. So, mm -hmm. um, yes. Let's turn now to looking at the Moore project um, with, with Megan. Um, you worked on this for us in 2016, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's another pretty exciting, exciting project. Um, yes. Megan, what can you tell us about this? Well, I can tell you that based on the original survey exam, um, this was selected because there was a series of cracks um, throughout the, it's a cast concrete sculpture um, that's been pigmented. And it was from 1933, made in 1933 by the artist. And there were a series of cracks that were visible on the surface um, when it was examined. And so that was the reason why um, it was sent to the lab was actually to address a structural issue. and. But when it came to the lab, we did a more of a thorough examination of it and we started to run into all sorts of interesting things. And what we realized, um, and this is a case where actually the history, you can go back to the images of it. 
sorry. Um, no, it's fine. The historic documentation that the camper had on file was a huge um, a contributor to what we learned about this painting and how we came up with our treatment choices. And that's because I could see visually an extensive network of cracks mm -hmm. and past um, conservation efforts. However, with their actual written documentation, I had records of when conservation efforts were taken in the last 25 years, and then also brief notes on something that had occurred and there was a break in 1950s. And so we had this kind of idea, but we also had images from that had been published of the sculpture throughout its period. So it was made in 1933. And you can see in the photograph that says early 1930s that it's sitting on the back. This was Henry Moore's studio and it's sitting on a pedestal. I don't know if you can tell, but there is no um, visual evidence of a wooden base on the sculpture. And then in the 1934 photograph, it's very difficult to tell the way the photograph was cropped, but it appears that there is also not a wooden base. And with the, with the additional photograph from um, pre-1946, again, we have a hard time seeing. But by the time it entered the Kemper's collection in 1946, only 13 years after it was made, there is a very evident image of the wooden base present on the sculpture. So when it arrived at the Mac lab, it was on this wooden base. And we knew that it had a series of conservation attempts, but in none of those attempts, did we have any indication that the wooden base had ever been removed from it? It was physically bolted to the sculpture. And so it had always just kind of been assumed that it was maybe original to the piece or at least an early edition. And um, in communication with the artist's foundation, and this is something we do frequently, um, living artists will contact them or their estates. Um, deceased artists um, for more modern and contemporary people from the 19th um, or 20th century, um, we will actually contact their foundations. And so we talked to someone from the Henry Moore Foundation and they also indicated that the base could have been applied by the studio, but was also not original to the piece. However, may have been added for some specific reason. So that's the information we had going into this. And if you want to move forward, we started doing some different types of examination. Christy mentioned looking at paintings with ultraviolet illumination in order to identify coatings present or past repairs. That is a technique that we also use with three-dimensional objects. And here you can see that the visible fluorescence that we see under ultraviolet um, indicated areas of old fills. So those areas that are dark, that are not fluorescing, those are actually old repair areas. There was also evidence of two different types of coating. There was uh, orange fluorescence, which is indicative of shellac, and there was a white adhesive residue, most likely um, a polyvinyl uh, adhesive, and, a, and so those were present. We knew where they were, so that kind of gave us more information about how many more damages were actually present versus just the visible cracks. Because a lot of that, um, those fills, you could not see with your naked eye. Some of them were not done very well. They, we call it, they were in-painted or over-painted, mm -hmm. Um, Overpainting is when they actually take more paint and cover more of the original surface so the fill is larger than is actually necessary. Um, in painting is when they stay within the break area. We also examined to get a better idea of its structure, the X radiography. And so here is a case, concrete is very dense and it's very hard to penetrate, particularly with the equipment we were using at the time. So in this case, um, you can't see any area where it's white, you can't really see through. However, this is a stitched compilation of images and there's a couple things you're going to see. Um, the first thing is that throughout the entire body, you're going to see this kind of exactly where uh, Kim is following her arrows. You see these kind of wires and a mesh like structure. We know that Henry Moore, when he made these, he would first make a, a clay or plasticine model. He would then encase it in plaster to make a negative mold. He would then take that mold and fill it with wires and chicken wire in order to create an internal armature. Then he would pour in the uh, pigmented cast concrete or the concrete into the mold and cast it. So what you're seeing is the armature inside. That's what those wires are. Um, when you look at the neck, you can see something a little more interesting. There are two modern screws that are present. So we had record that in the 1950s, the neck was repaired. Well, this allowed us to see exactly how it was repaired. A little more aggressive than what we would do, although sometimes we do use pins. 
So there are two screws. Another thing they had done, um, and you could actually see some of the network of cracks in that area. Another thing they had done was actually cut the wire armature and because they couldn't get the break to line up with where the wires were sticking. So they actually severed some of those wires and so they're not really lined up or connecting anymore. So, and you can also see, if you look down at the base of the, um, straight down from the neck along the base, you can see one of the bolts that's actually anchoring it the inside into the wooden base. Yep, right there. So that gave us a lot more knowledge. And so basically what we decided moving forward was that in order to really understand what's happened with this piece and to prepare the brakes properly, we had to actually take it off of the wood base for the first time. So as we began, we, the first thing I did was after the documentation, all the photograph documentation was done for before treatment, we began removing the old fills. And so this was taking off all that overpaint and starting to see what was original, what was fill material. And so here we're revealing along one of the edges, you can see how much of the surface was restoration fill material along the side. And then we could also see that there was a layer of plaster between the bottom of the concrete and the wooden base. And this started as we started to look more carefully at the sculpture, it had been painted to look just like a sculpture. But what happened was it's actually an entire non-original layer of material that was actually raising the entire sculpture up off that base by a quarter of an inch. So actually adding to the thickness of that original base. So this was getting a little more interesting. In order to get that base off, we had to lay it on its side and when we removed it, we saw this entire layer of plaster that had been poured onto it. And the plaster and adhesive was physically, the, basically the plaster was poured onto the wooden base and this piece set in it. So that was done at the time that it was made. This also indicated when we took that wooden base off, we saw how flexible the base was itself. And so what had happened over time was that this layer of plaster the concrete and the wood were not responding well together. So every time there was movement or handling, slowly what happened was that it was basically shifting like this, causing an extensive network to keep cracking. Every time it was repaired, people just kept putting more adhesive in, not actually taking it off and addressing the problem. So this is a case where our proposed treatment was to address the cracks. We left room in the proposal to find out what may happen because we could tell that there was something strange going on. But we really actually modified the proposal and continued talking with the curators and the registrars and staff at the Kemper throughout the entire process to make sure that they were comfortable with the way this treatment was changing because it was heading in a different direction. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Kim, but. Uh, I have to say, the, the day that I got this email with this, this image, I was just like, oh my God, um, you, you know that when you take an approach like this, you have to trust your trust your team and trust your conservators because um, so it might look scary, but you know that you guys are trained um, and that you have the expertise to work methodically and and have all of the right tools at hand. Something like this could have never been undertaken at our retrofitted space here. Um, this was a pretty major treatment, um, but it's one that we're really pretty satisfied with in the end and the appearance of it is, is dramatically improved. Um, and the subtleties of the, the repairs that you, that you performed and the inpainting that you performed, I mean, it really has looked better than it's ever looked. Um, we, we also now understand that like the, the base itself, while it was, um, added to add additional support for the object. It was added with like all of the best intentions. Mm -hmm. um, we also recognize that it doesn't necessarily um, aid in the support. It actually caused more harm than good. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just like however best we try, sometimes we have to continue to look and observe and modify the plan. Um, the sculpture traveled a lot in its early life. Um, but now it's definitely on the no loan list. <laughs> um, and as David Lobig added I mean, in, the, in the comments, I mean, it's, it's really quite heavy. I mean, it's, it is cast concrete. Um, so we needed to have something pretty sturdy to, to move it around with. Um, but now we have a specially designed plate um, that is 
pretty invisible. Um, and it, and it, looks, it looks fantastic. Um, um, I'll just add quickly that one of the things that by the end of the treatment, while we learned a lot throughout the process and we had a lot of good information going into it, um, we did learn that the biggest reason, if you look at the bottom of the sculpture, when it was cast, it was not a flat surface. So those original, those breaks, particularly uh, along what you see on the left side of the screen, um, where you can see the sort of breaks in the plaster, all of that was repair damage. It must have broken within its first 10 years. And it was probably from carrying it and having uneven weight distribution on the bottom. Just the way the, where the chest is and the head is a much heavier than where sort of the legs are. It's kind of the proportions um, and that it, damage happened early. Maybe it fell, we don't know exactly what happened. But when they did this, they really did, as Kim mentioned, tried to do their best for it. Um, but what we, when we made the new mount, we took into consideration that weight distribution and not wanting it to shift. So there is a heavy duty steel plate with uh, an epoxy mount that is custom formed right to the very bottom of what you see. And on the bottom, we did not hide all of those spills. So in the future, it could easily be removed from that mount. Um, it, if it tipped on its side, it could be easily taken off. Here you can see it on display. Um, and actually the proportions work out better without the base and that extra quarter inch of material. Mm -hmm. And the idea of reversibility and documentation of treatments is just so incredibly important. Um, while you're able to understand a lot about an object's history based on assessments of its current condition, um, actually having written documents about what happened and what material used um, can greatly aid in the, the development of a new treatment proposal and an understanding of the, the condition and why, why something might be going on. Mm -hmm. um, but the approach that we took for this object is definitely not a one-size-fits-all. I, no. I'm going to just do it this way. Um, this was a pretty, pretty unique approach. Um, but really, that's true of like every conservation project. There is no one-size-fits-all method because each, each process was created, each work was created by a different hand um, using different materials, and it has a, had a life. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it actually makes an interesting transition to kind of looking at objects that have had a really long history. Um, we, right before we closed, we installed the museum's collection of ancient Greek vases, some of them anyway, in our new Bayer Gallery. Um, and these objects have been with the museum since 1904 after they were displayed at the, at the museum. Um, and to ready put them for display, um, we used the survey assessments that had been done back in 2010, 2011. Um, over the past few years, we've kind of slowly been chipping away at treating them. Um, most of the treatments have been pretty minimal, um, but some of them are, are much bigger. Um, can we take a look at the Hermanax painters, Norwin and Flora, as a, as a starting place? Um, what, what do you do to prepare this space for display? What, what are its needs? Um, as you mentioned, these have been very small treatments, and yet they're almost as important as doing something big and invasive like the Moore treatment. And the reason is, is that these, making sure an object is stable. It is not structurally unstable. However, you've got glazes that like to um, be worn and popped off, and there are maybe fine cracks. Um, many times there's areas of old repair that may have been um, covering original material or with uh, more non-reversible materials that are actually can sometimes more too hard for the object and it could be causing other problems. So we really looked at all of them to make sure that they are structurally stable and clean and in the best condition for display. So again, small treatments, but very important for long-term needs. One of the things we also consider for this collection is the fact that it is an active collection, meaning these the Greek vases are utilized by the university in multiple ways. And while they're, they appear static in their display cases, I'm pretty sure they will be removed from time to time for more close examination by students um, and faculty. And that is something that's really important. Uh, you need to be able to look at something, but that means more handling and handling always poses a risk. So we wanna make sure that they're again in their best condition. 
here you can see um, on the bottom right, you see a crack around the handle. One of the problems that this face had was small cracks that have just formed over time. They could likely be there from the time it was in a burial condition. Uh, we don't know, again, the history of those cracks. However, we want to make sure they're stable. Um, we never handle an object like this by its handles. However, we always want to support it from its base, but we still want to make sure that there's no risk. There. And so small amounts of uh, stable adhesive are actually used with a syringe and whipped into those cracks. Uh, you can't see it, um, but it does provide that just that extra amount of bond to really make sure that it's not going to go away. Also, there's small little areas of uh, glaze or slip loss, and you see that reveals the, um, the body of the ceramic. And we just want to stabilize that area, again, with a very dilute, stable um, adhesive in a way that that glaze loss will not continue to flake off if it is unstable. You see the small hole. We don't know when that hole was, um, how it happened. It looks almost like a trowel mark. Um, maybe when, during archeology span when it was discovered, possibly was hit by a trowel, or maybe it happened in burial where it was poked or protruded by some other object that was in the ground, or maybe, we don't know. We don't know what the history is. But in this case, with a historic object such as Greek ceramics, we don't fill it. It is stable, it doesn't need it structurally, and it's part of the history of the object. So we take a very different approach, unlike the Moor, where you wouldn't want to put it on display with all of the losses visible because you totally lose the artist's intent. Here, this is a totally different object that was made for use and has a decorative painting and has a different history. So we take a very different approach with our treatment. And again, all of these decisions are made in concert with the owner or the curator and how they want to see the objects. But generally with um, classical objects and Greek faces, we really do go on a more minimal approach. And as, as Megan mentioned, I mean, these have been used for, for years, yet study sessions. Um, so any object that hasn't traditionally been on view, we allow classes to come into the classroom and look at objects up close and personal. Um, so a hole like this may seem kind of confusing, but it does offer teaching opportunities to kind of think about how thin is the material in this, por in this portion of the shoulder of the vase. Um, and the more you obscure about an object's history, sometimes you lose the opportunity to talk about its history. Mm -hmm. um, um, can this you is talk a little bit about this? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. This is a case usually really where we're just using ultraviolet illumination as another example of how we can look and study um, Greek faces mm -hmm. um, and similar types of objects. Um, many times we are using conservators use ultraviolet illumination as a method of identifying repair or coatings. Um, and but also sometimes here you can see while there is no area of damage or repair in this UV image, you can see how the slip glazes um, vary in their fluorescence. So it can also just lead a little bit more information. And sometimes, even if it's the slip or glaze has worn off visually and you can't see it, ultraviolet will allow you to see where it was because there are still very minimal traces that are not necessarily clearly visible to the eye, but it can be picked up by the remnants that are left. So it's just a good examination. This is another... <laughs> You're looking at the uh, cantharos? Uh, yeah. This is the cantharos, and this one had um, a case where the before and after treatment don't look much different. However, it's a case where it had been heavily, it was broken, uh, found in a broken state most likely, and repaired. And many times old repairs, um, the materials we've used over time, just like the linings that Christy discussed with painting, they've changed. And it used to be, we try to use as many reversible materials as possible so that it could be easily taken apart again in the future if something went wrong or if it was damaged or if aesthetically somebody wanted it a different way. Um, we try to make that, that a case that we can be reversible. So here is a case where very um, materials that were stronger than the original ceramic were used, but one of the fills, an area of loss had been completely filled and that fill was loose. Also, the paint was overpainted. It covered more of the original surface than necessary. So during treatment, all of the old paint was taken off and then those fills were made sure that they were stable. Areas where there was the fill had chipped out or was lost was filled to make it flush. 
And then in the end, they were all painted in painted, so staying within the line, break area only on the fill material only. It was painted again. You can see that this is a case where we leave our fills visible. So you see, and this was actually the case with the first treatment that was done too. You can see where the breaks are clearly when you look at this object on display. And that's again intentional. This is an object where it's more of an educational thing. It is more to understand its history, to know that this object has been damaged in its past, most likely um, long, long ago. Um, we want that to be distinguishable. We don't want to deceive the viewer in this case. So we do take a different approach and we make it not distracting by making it a different like a slightly different shade. In this case, it's more of a matte black versus the high gloss. And yet we want it to blend in. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, it, it really seems like there's so much thought and consideration that goes into to planning every, every treatment. Um, and I've always enjoyed the opportunity to kind of have you guys the on presence and on phone calls to be able to, to have this dialogue and to have this back and forth. Um, and I, I wanted to take a moment to, to open this up to, to all of our attendees today. Um, just to, to apologize, one, just that I didn't stop for questions more frequently, but just to now give you a chance to, to chime in and, and to ask questions. I'm happy to scroll back and forth to to any particular slide if you have a question about a specific object. Um, just want to open it up. Um, um, both of you have a lot of a lot of training and a lot of expertise in these specific areas. And one of the great things about working with Mac is that you have a whole team of, of people on hand with different different knowledge bases um, and expertises. Um, and just the fact that you can work in a Greek face and a, a modern sculpture, um, I mean, while those approaches are similar, um, you also have to kind of have specific training for working on those objects. Um, it's, it's a lot to ask, but um, it definitely has been successful. Um, has the field changed a lot over the last 50 years or so? Uh Christy, do you want to answer that? Sure. Yeah. So definitely, the field has uh, has changed over the over the years, as in the case with both the Chase and the Minor. Um, what we talked about earlier uh, with linings, in particular, those have evolved. The the type of adhesive that's used um, and the philosophy of lining has changed over the decades. Um, materials and um, and the philosophy materials have evolved and new materials are invented um, often. So um, that, that changes. And, and part of our field also is, um, part of our code of ethics also is to, to do minimal treatment. Um, try not to you know, do something that's over invasive, for instance. Um, and that's part of the reason why linings have changed. Um, just, and also for things to be reversible as um, Megan was talking about with the with the more um, just so that as things evolve and as treatment um, steps and materials evolve throughout the years that maybe something else will something better will come down the line and we it can be reversed and redone if need be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll add that we spend a lot of time repairing previously restored works of art. Art has been, as long as it's been created, somebody has been fixing it or restoring it or conserving it. And so that is a huge, we definitely would say we see more of that type of work than we do something that's never been damaged and is broken for the first time. Although that happens too. But because of that, we also find that the materials, we have a whole field of conservation science as the, a partner to us. And they are constantly looking at the materials we use and the materials the artists have used and how they interact over time. And then we learn things that change. As new materials come on the market, you know, oh, a synthetic varnish, it's gonna be perfect. But then we realize it cross links. And so then we can't get it off as easily. So we have to stop using that and switch. So we are evolving in our material choices and what's available as well as just our techniques and our, our methodology. Have, 
it was an interesting question. Has, has anyone ever sent you something that you refused to treat? Um, I wouldn't say refuse to treat, um, but sometimes the outcome isn't mm -hmm. Like managing expectations, like the outcome isn't what the client might right. want, or like, um, mm -hmm. for instance, a painting that has been in a house fire, for instance. And I mean, while you can probably stabilize it and, and help it, it's just not exactly what there, there's only so much that we can do, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of things that we, we can't reverse or change about it. Mm -hmm. um, I would. I say that from my perspective, I see that there are very few things I would refuse to treat, but exactly as Christy said, mm -hmm. um, sometimes with very contemporary, pristine surfaces. Um, I had an object come through the lab recently where it was um, such a perfect, smooth, just very minimal texture, high gloss, just the color. It had big dents in it and there is no way it is just not possible to make them completely mm -hmm. invisible. And so mm -hmm. the object has been damaged to a point, while minimal, that it can't look whole again. So while I will mm -hmm. treat it, as Christy said, it's managing expectations. We have to make sure they know that we can't make them, we can't always work magic. We can do it a lot, but not always. <laughs> Um, I like this interesting question from Anthony Riano. He, he asks, has Mac had any interesting finds, perhaps mislabeling, forgeries, et cetera? Um, it, it seems like the more was a surprising project to a certain extent, but um, has there been anything else that's proven to have some magic to it? In the history, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I can say in the history of Mac, there have definitely been times where, well, I guess what we say is that the analytical and examination, the research that we will do both analytically and with our visual and examination techniques can lead to the discoveries of something maybe not being what it was supposed to be or maybe attributing it to an artist. We at Mac typically do not say that we did it. We usually provide all the facts to the owner and the client and let them come to that conclusion if they need to. Um, because we, again, don't wanna you know, stir up the pot too much if not necessary. Mm -hmm. However, uh, usually when that, in most cases, it's a museum client who also believes for other um, research and provenance reasons that maybe something else is going on and so that they're usually prepared for the information that we find. And most of the times we hope it's on the more um, exciting positive side than on the, it's not what it's supposed to be side, but they both have. Right, M many times it, it's come to the lab for those reasons, just to try to investigate a little further and see, um, maybe it's attributed mm -hmm. to somebody, but there's some reason to believe that maybe it's not. And so we just mm -hmm. need to investigate a little further. I treated as just as an example, I treated a frame for a painting and there was a very small amount of questioning of whether or not the painting had been done in the studio by an assistant to the artist. Um, basically that the artist was working on a painting and a smaller copy was being made by an assistant at the same time. And the, the attribution was kind of fuzzy, but scholars were pretty confident that the artist actually did both paintings side by side, one was very, very large and one was a much more standard painting size and that he was using the smaller painting to work out the composition and get the kinks out and then transferring that to the bigger canvas. Um, and it was actually, I was treating the frame and one of the paintings conservators was treating the painting and there was an old nameplate on the frame. And when we took it off, hand painted, mm -hmm. it was an original frame, hand painted on the frame was the artist signature of the original frame. So we had that confirmation and it wasn't even on the painting, but it was the frame that, nope, this was actually, and there's lots of other information that led to this, but it was one little contributing bit that was fun to be part of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the act of close looking and just really can reveal interesting finds. Um, but it also, as you said, I mean, there's a certain amount of ethics that, that's involved in all of this and you have to kind of play a line carefully between overstating something or um, providing concrete, definitive answers for anything. Um, 
um, have a lot of liability. Um, I mean, do you have to deal with that when you are entering into a treatment project? Because um, potentially something could not be fixed or become could become worse. Um, is that an issue? Um, we, when every institution or client signs our treatment proposal, they are basically understanding that yes, we have liability, but if you're allowing us to attempt to do what we're doing, then mm -hmm. you, you are also undertaking that liability. <laughs> um, we are trained very heavily in what we do. And so we do not approach anything like that. As Christy mentioned, tiny solvent tests are done first before we go to the big thing. We do a lot of investigative research um, and we have a lot of experience. And so we, we really have a good feeling for that. It doesn't mean that things don't ever go wrong. We hope it's rare, it is rare, but it does happen. And in that case, we are working with the client as, uh, as a partnership in understanding that there is always a risk to anything. Mm -hmm. Do you ever collaborate with the artists themselves? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do collaborate with the artists. Anytime there's a living artist or a foundation, um, then yes, that's just another resource that um, mm -hmm. that needs to be tapped when when yeah. undergoing a treatment. If that's if that's a possibility, then yes, we definitely mm -hmm. do that. Um, is it is that an aspect of the job that you find challenging or helpful? Both. <laughs> um, I would probably say both. <laughs> yes, I mean, you know, it could be, yes, both for sure. <laughs> sometimes living artists can be very helpful. They're, well, they're almost always helpful, but sometimes they can, it, it can be two ways. Sometimes they're like, oh, you're doing great. No worries. Just do your own thing. And it's like, wait, wait, I need more information from you. Or they, you know, what did you use? And they're like, I don't know. You know, I just, <laughs> um, and then other times that there, you know, are sometimes discussions, um, there is one artist who's notorious for when his major outdoor sculptures are being conserved, and he's like, ooh, I'd like to change the color of that now. And it's like, no, this has been in an institution's collection for 30 years, you can't change right. the color. So you, there are sometimes conversations like that that happen, but all in all, it's very rewarding. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I, I get, gather from both of you that you love your jobs and that, that everything is exciting and interesting, although every project varies. Um, and then what motivates you, what motivates you to do your job um, at the end of the day? Um, I, I think for me, I really love the thought process, how every work of art is different. And I, I just, I love that. Um, the collaboration, the ability to be able to work with, you know, objects conservators and paper conservators and my colleagues in the paintings lab, um, textiles that we can all, we all, as you said, Kim, um, earlier, that we all bring in a different area of expertise and a different understanding of different materials. And so that is um, that whole thought process and being able to collaborate with my colleagues is, is really fun. Um, I also, enjoy having um, you know a private client bring in a painting that means something to them and you know and something has happened to it and they just um, they just need help with it you know and it, it just mm -hmm. I, that really I like that connection to to the um, to the clients as well both member institutions such as yourself and with uh, with my colleagues and with private clients mm -hmm. How about you, Adam? I feel very similar to Christy. Um, it is really, I, with three-dimensional objects, um, I can, I hardly ever see the same thing twice. Uh, I surely never get to use the same treatment approach twice. Um, so every day is a new learn. I cannot get bored, ever. Um, <laughs> I am always learning so much more and enjoying that. I also find that um, I can look at an object that may not be aesthetically my cup of tea. It may not be something that I would walk in a museum and be like, oh, I love that work of art. But by the time I'm finished working with it and I have investigated it and I've learned its materials and I've seen the workmanship behind it, um, I have such a great appreciation for it and the artist 
It could be somebody's grandfather who carved something in his basement or a famous artist. And I will feel that same, like there was a love and a connection and a thought that went behind it. And the, sometimes the just sheer technique that artists have used is just unbelievable. And being able to be up close and personal and really see that from the inside out um, is one of the things that gets me going every day to get back to work and keep, keep going through the very sometimes tedious, very particular tasks and repetitive tasks that we end up doing. Um, it's really rewarding. And knowing that in the same time, we're helping preserve this for future generations to see. It's really wonderful. And cultures, cultural material, that, that cultural material is available for the cultures who it was intended to be for. Right, right. Um, I mean, do you think that it's important that conservators think about their role in preserving cultural memory? I think so. I think that's definitely something we need to always be conscious of. And I think that in this current time we're living in, um, I think that the, act, the conservation community as a whole, the art conservation community in, in the United States and around the world is thinking about that very carefully. And um, and I think our field will change from it some. I think we are already really working hard at becoming a more diverse community. Um, the conservation field is a small niche and it needs to be more diverse and we're working on that. And I think that we are looking at other ways where um, MAC for instance, and we work heavily with Native American communities and it's really interesting to um, learn from them and it's it's a very different approach we take with their materials with the cultural objects than we do with muse static museum objects um, and even museum objects we don't think of them as static all the time and so we're always kind of that's an evolving process and it is important for us to be aware of it um, one last question that was asked early on and i don't want to leave without um, is is just quickly, it's just, these are not um, quick projects. Um, they take time, they take evaluation, assessment, um, but the costs for them, I mean, it, it isn't a cheap endeavor for a, a client, even a private client to, to take this on. How do you establish kind of within your treatment proposals, the, the cost estimate? Um, so, well, the cost estimate is, is based on what the painting needs. So every painting, every object is different. Um, it, it just, some, some steps are more um, involved than others as, as we saw with the minor versus the chase. And so it, it's all dependent on that. It can range from, you know, a few hundred dollars to, you know, tens of thousands for something really large, like a large institution, mm -hmm. moving a mural, for instance, or something like that. So it, it, it ranges drastically. Right, right. So from a few hundred, a few thousand dollars to the yeah. size of the limit, <laughs> the the limit. Of time. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think now is, a, now is a good time to wrap up. Um, so thank you again, both, for making the time to, to talk today. Um, I wanted to also thank everyone in attendance. Um, it's been great to talk with you, uh, to welcome you here to the museum, even virtually. Um, we will be posting a recording of this uh, conversation on our website in the next week or so. And you will also all be receiving an email with a survey um, to give you feedback on the conversation um, and also to invite you to subscribe to our mailing list. Um, we are trying to do quite a bit online these days, and you can continue to connect with us through our website and social media. Um, Kemper Connect is kind of our hashtag on all of this, but we've been trying to do a lot of fun things and um, engage, with, engage with all of you as best we can um, until we're able to open our doors again. Um, so with that, I will say thank you again to Megan and Christy. And thank you. Thank you for inviting us. This is very fun. It's a pleasure Thanks to be later. with you today. Thank you. All right. We'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, everyone.